Flau, Oliver, Mejidaukaru, first of all, thank you for accepting our invitation and coming to our country. Eh, Oliver Meyer, esa mesa la doctora da ingresar en didáctica ira caslea Johannes Gutenberg Universitatean, Mainzen. Bere doktor ego tesiak estrategia erabilia konzienteari buruzko jarraibea kematen ditu eta horren eragina e, irak kasleen ahozko gaitasunaren garapenean. Bere interesgune handia, handiena da, evidentzietan oinarritutako irak askuntza estrategia berritzailea garatzea eta zabaltzea. Oliver Meyerrek e, hainbaz testu liburu idatzi ditu eta gaur egun testu liburu digitalean belaun aldi berrirako konzeptu markoa eraikitzen lan egiten du. Gaur egun ere, CLIL eta alfabetizazio anitzen inguruan proiektu bat koordinatzen du Europako Kontseiluaren Hizkuntza Modernoen Zentroa Graz taldearen taldekide moduan. So, it was short, wasn't it? But now it's your, your turn. Okay? I, didn't, I didn't understand the word, but I think it was perfect. <laughs> yeah, okay. non. That's about the only word I know in Basque, I'm sorry. But... Uh, uh, I don't think I've ever been in a room which was more beautiful than this one. The view is just uh, breathtaking. And uh, I've been to the Basque country a couple of times, and I'm so happy to be able to return. Now, uh, before I start, uh, let me just maybe say a few words about uh, who I am and what I do. Maybe it helps uh, understand uh, things, make it more, uh, make it easier, maybe. So uh, I'm Oliver. And I used to be a teacher for English as a foreign language and geography. And I taught both uh, subjects uh, in secondary edu uh, schools from grades five till grades 13, so when uh, they do their A-levels. And, uh, and one day in summer, I was approached by my principal, and he said, well, you teach geography and you teach English. Have you ever thought about you know, mixing them? And that's how it all started. And I thought, being trained to teach geography and being trained to teach English as a foreign language would give me everything I need to teach geography through English. And it turned out that I was very wrong about this. And uh, I, I was not prepared for this at all. So what I did is I reached out to the university and I said, uh, I have to teach uh, clear lessons now and I don't feel I'm ready for this. So why don't we work together? And from that moment on, uh, the university sends students to my classroom. And since our classrooms are not nearly as nicely as equipped as this one here, uh, they had to sit on the bookshelves. So I had five to 10 students every lesson. And they were sitting on the bookshelves in the back. And they were filming my every lessons. And that went on for about a whole school year. And at times, that felt really uncomfortable because they would watch my lessons and then would criticize my lessons and get back to me with feedback, saying things like, why don't you do stuff that is interesting? <laughs> and so on. And uh, so we started thinking up about this and we learned. And uh, we tried to reach out to people and con get connected with people from other parts of Europe. And this is how it all started. And uh, I thought naively, and uh, I think I still think I'm right uh, in my expectations, but way back then I thought if I go talk to the CLIL experts in Europe, they could give me answers, right? Because that's what experts do. They know how things work. And I was never so wrong in my life. So I met these people, but I found out that they didn't have the answers that we were looking for because most of the time, the kind of stuff that university researchers do translates not very well into the questions we have as teachers. That's a very difficult thing to do. So uh, we started working together, and ever since that moment, we have uh, tried to find an answer to one question, which is how can we help our students learn and how can we improve that experience? And in the beginning, um, maybe I'm sure you saw some of these presentations. When CLIL was introduced or when CLIL was hyped all across Europe like 10 years ago or maybe even earlier, it was hailed as the panacea or the remedy 
for all of educational problems. So if you do CLEAL, uh, you will probably not only raise the smartest children, but they might live forever. And if you do CLEAL, you get two for the price of one. So you teach a subject through, uh, through a different language or foreign language, and not only will they become better at the subject, but they will become much better at the language almost automatically and almost for free. Okay, and all it takes is for you teachers to work twice as hard and uh, work it all out in the afternoon. And it took us quite a while to uh, find out that this approach is just not sincere and it doesn't work that way. And it was not until the late 2000s, 2008 and 9, that we saw research, not only uh, in Germany, but in many European countries where they said, wait a minute, maybe it's just not okay in terms of research to c compare CLIL students to normal language learners because we are comparing apples to pears. It doesn't work that way. Also, what we see in most European countries is that whenever schools offer CLIL programs, there is so much selection going on that usually only the top elite students move into those CLIL programs, which makes it so much harder to compare CLIL to non-CLIL students. They're just too different in so many respects. So we had to really dial down on the research and saying maybe it's not as euphoric as we thought it was. And then people started to become interested in different aspects, saying maybe it's not about who's better at language learning, but maybe we should comp look at how about the subject? What about the content? And does the question of do I learn content through language one or language two, does that affect the quality of the content somehow? And the, uh, some of the results we saw uh, were so disturbing that we started working together uh, on a European project and that's what we've been doing for the last almost 10 years. And what I can uh, show you today is all the things that we have found in the process, and, but the big uh, problem is for everything we find, we come up with two more questions. So uh, that's just the way it is because learning is really, really complex. But back to the, these uh, research results that we saw that we find so disturbing. Uh, the first uh, thing that people found out was, well, if we compare subject performance in one language to subject performance in L2, it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference, which sounds like a good thing, right? But there was this huge but in this article saying, if we look at what the students are actually writing down on paper, the actual things that they produce, and when we compare that to the things that we expect from them, then all the students fall short. So neither the L2 students nor the L1 students seem to be able to really express their understanding in a way that was appropriate to the subject. So we were talking 10th, 10th graders, 16 year old geography students. And in the meantime, we have found similar results in many subjects for many age groups in many countries. So there are even uh, really uh, huge and well done international studies taken at college level and uh, post college level where they say there are some cases where we see decreasing competences over time. So it seems that people are not only learning very little at university, but they may learn the wrong things or unlearn things. And that is quite troubling, right? So, uh, and the explanation that we have is, if I cannot explain things properly, then it's probably because I haven't fully understood them. And that is our key problem, okay? And, uh, and how can we help kids understand and how can we help them become better uh, at expressing their understanding? And I have brought 
quite a few things, uh, but instead of you know talking about all the research, which I'll do later, and trying to explain all these concepts, what I brought, maybe hopefully as a gift, are metaphors, pictures that you may, or in your mind that you may be used to rethink the way we think of learning. And I brought a, a number of short videos to illustrate that. And we'll start with something that has become very important to us, even though we are not behind this. We haven't produced it. So this is just something that one of my colleagues found on the internet, but it sums up what we mean by deeper learning in such a perfect way and it's really, really accessible. So let's start with this. It's very short, just five minutes, but I think it, captu it captures everything. And I do think it's quite easy to understand. I say to teachers, Second, I thought they if they're not getting high quality work, could they learn something from this? And what would you say to them that they could do differently in their classrooms? This is a story called Austin's Butterfly. And it's a true story about a first grade boy, and his name is Austin, and he goes to school, or used to go to school, in a town called Boise, Idaho. And in his class in Boise, Idaho, they were studying butterflies, and he had to do a project. His job in first grade was to draw a butterfly, and this is the butterfly that he picked. Austin had to use this photograph as his model, and he had to draw an accurate scientific drawing of this butterfly. This is called a tiger swallowtail. I knew it! Can you tell Toby why it's called tiger? Because it kind of has the stripes of the tiger yeah. right there. Good. So here was Austin's job. He was supposed to do a scientific drawing of that butterfly. But remember, Austin was only in first grade. And you know what he did? He forgot to look like a scientist carefully. He got his paper and he just started to draw the image of a butterfly that he had in his head. And he wasn't looking like a scientist and so this is what he drew. Whoa. It's not bad and it is a butterfly, but does it look exactly like this? No. No, it doesn't yet. It doesn't look exactly like this yet. And so they didn't look at this and say, good Austin, you're done. They said, Austin, good start. Now we can start giving you critiques so you can do a second draft and make it better and a third draft and make it better and you can make it much, much closer to this and he was ready to go. All of the first graders in his critique group sat on the floor like you guys are and they decided to split their advice into two kinds. First, just the shape of the wings. And then when the shape was right, they'd give him advice about the pattern inside the wings. Alia, what would you say? You can make it much pointier. Good. These wings could be much pointier. Who else would add something? Attack, what would you say? About the angle, because not to be mean about yes. the angle, it's just not exact, so... Um, okay, so show me. Come on up here, Attack. Show me where, what you would ask him to do slightly differently. Um, like to make it a little longer. Longer where? Draw right. where you would do it. Right there. Okay, so pull this out longer. Yeah. That's very specific, Attack. Thank you. Jamila, what would you say? It's like, like, a uh, triangle. Good. Jamila, I love that. So you're saying more like a triangle shape. And I agree. Well, you know what? Those first graders came up with most of those same ideas. And you know what Austin said? He said, okay, I'll go try. And he went back to his seat and he drew this. Does this look more like a triangle? Yeah. Yeah. Did he go out further, like Atak was suggesting? Yes. Yeah. Did he add some jaggedness here? Yes. yes. Like Cindy, did he get rid of that bottom thing? Yes. So he did listen to his friends, and he made it better. It's not perfect. Toby, what would you say? I'd say don't put those little tail things so pointed in. I'd say put them more pointed down. Good. OK, Ethan, what would you say? Um, I think you should make the wings like this, not like this. Like OK, that. he listened to his friends, and they said, this is really a lot better, Austin. That second draft really is better. Yeah, maybe he can make a third one. Good. Maybe he could make a third draft. Yeah. And so he did this draft. That's his third draft. That's his third draft, Hadley. That's just right. Elijah, what do you notice there? Well, one wing's more 
pointed than the other, and that side is a little bit higher than the other. Good. Coburn? Um, right here, it doesn't have the inside thing still. Ah, okay. Needs a little bit more of that notch. So, do you think maybe he should do a fourth draft? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's just what he said. He said, shoot, okay, I got round again. I'll go back and do a fourth draft. Listened. You listened. Does it look more even like Elijah was suggesting? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And does it look like it's coming out a little sharper, like yeah. Cindy was suggesting? And like Attack was saying, it's a little, the angle is, looks a little better. So now Austin was feeling really good. He said, am I ready to add some pattern? And they said, okay, why don't you try adding some of the pattern? And he did. <laughs> He's good at it. He is so good. And then they said, Austin, you're ready for color. Let's look at his last draft. Wow. And what do you think? Did it come out really good? Yeah. Yeah. It actually looks way better. What do you think about how much progress he made? And talk, what would you say about his progress? He made like, a lot of progress. He persevered during it. His friends were honest with him. What was it about the kinds of advice that they gave? that allowed him to get better each time. Hassan? Well, they told him what was wrong about it. Did they say it's just wrong, or were they more specific? Than that? They were more specific, but they weren't mean about it. Great. Hadley? He made six drafts. And so is that, a, is that something that other kids should learn from? What, yeah. you learn, what should we learn from that? We can make other drafts if it's not right. Good. So if you can keep, if it's not right, you can keep doing more drafts to make it better. You just don't use the things in your head. You want to use a um, sharp eye. Good. He used the eyes of a scientist. Okay. And that's about picture perfect. So it is about using the eyes or the skills of a scientist. And I think the reason why I think we show this video to just about everybody from my own students to all the teachers we work with and, and, and even real phys, uh, physicists and scientists is because it really captures the essence of what we mean by progress and what we mean by going deeper, saying it's not enough to get students to draw. Okay, many times we think when we, when we say we teach with a focus on competencies, it's really important to get students to do things, right? Because that's what competence is all about. It's an applied knowledge or whatever you, uh, however way you define that. But that's clearly not enough. We need to make sure that it's not only about the doing, but about doing things better and doing things in an appropriate way. And uh, I was raised in a system that was very different from this. So uh, when I was educated to become a, a geography trainer, uh, we found ourselves in the very unfortunate situation that we just had one geography lesson a week, which is amounts next to nothing and which is ridiculous in terms of thinking about deeper learning, deeper understanding, all these things which sound so nice. But if you only have one lesson a week, you can't even think about these things. So all we did and all we were trained to do is work with butterfly stage one. So in week one, we taught them how to uh, draw a butterfly. In the next week, we, uh, we, we showed them how to draw an elephant. And then they had to draw a cow. And in the week after, a giraffe. And at the end of the year, we had completed our curriculum, but we were complaining that they didn't know anything about geography. Okay, and it's really easy to say the student these days don't know any geography anymore, right? Uh, but it's not that simple. And it's be also because I never thought about learning this way. The way we were trained to teach was always to think about, it's all about the curriculum. It's us teachers making sure that the curriculum gets taught properly. But the more, about, the more I think about it, the more I think that things need to be changed dramatically. It's not us teaching the curriculum. It's 
us working with curriculum developers in such a way to make sure that we design curricula which make room for this, to say we really need our students to understand things. We really need them to be able to draw scientifically, to observe scientifically, because these are the things that they use for their life after school. And in order to do that, they need to follow a number of uh, principles that we can do research on and that we can specify, but teachers need the time to work on these things, because this is nothing that happens in 45 minutes. But if you just look at this video, the progress this kid made is just phenomenal. And uh, I observe the same thing every day. My kids are 12 and 13, and it's almost the same thing, okay? They're taught how to do different things on different days of the week, then they are assessed, and then they move on to the next thing. And it's really problematic because by the end of the year, they forgot most of what they did at school. And it's, it's not that they forgot things, because that is maybe not even problematic because we all forget things, but it's that they lose their joy of learning, okay? So my son has developed this really intense antipathy towards literature because the way they're asked to analyze poems and texts is not helping. And nobody ever tells them, look, this is how you can do it. These are the language elements that you can use, and these are the steps you take, and here's a really good interpretation of a poem. Why don't you use this so you can come up with your own really good version? Instead, they are tested, he gets a grade, and they're saying, you're not good at analyzing poems. Okay, and then we wonder why kids find poems really boring. Okay, it's all connected and that's what, what makes it so difficult. So, what I'm trying to do today is show you what we have found out in the last almost 10 years since uh, this started. And again, none of this is my own uh, invention. This is all a team effort. I'm just here representing all the things we've come up with in many, many years with many, many people from many, many different countries. Okay, so this is started as an ECML project and we were lucky enough to uh, be able to invite all the experts we wanted to work with and then we started working with teachers. So from the get-go we tried to include many people. So what is it that I bring to the table today? I bring this, I bring the idea of uh, deeper learning because that is something we found and the implication of that concept and the research we uh, have unearthed now is enough to make us rethink the way we teach and to make us rethink the way we learn. And I'd like to show you some of the research and maybe, maybe even more importantly, what that means for us as teachers. So this is what we found, and the report is uh, one of the best I had uh, the pleasures to read. You can find it online. Uh, it's about how we teach 21st century skills to our students. And the, uh, the whole report is about these so-called 21st century skills. And according to the authors, uh, Pellegrino and Hilton, it means that what we do or when we learn things at a deeper level, then we're able to take things that we learn in one context or situation and transfer it to another. So this is what deeper learning is all about. It's all about transfer or it's about the ability to apply our knowledge and understanding to different contexts. Now, that the report is, uh, is uh, difficult or problematic in that it debunks quite a few myths about learning that we've been carrying around for many, many years. So, for instance, uh, this report is very clear in specifying that the only way we can go deep, the only way we can train for transfer is by going deep within the subject. 
there's no way that we can teach transversal or uh, interdisciplinary skills by themselves because that obviously doesn't work. And uh, Jim Pellegrino is very, very uh, uh, outspoken about this. He, uh, he once told me in a conversation, he said, you know, the idea that we have general problem solving skills that we can apply to every situation and that we can train with our students just like that, devoid of any content, is just crazy. It doesn't work. So if we want our students to understand things, we need to show them how to do and think and communicate in our subjects. That is really, really essential. And he goes on to say that deeper learning is not just about the cognitive. It's also about personal and interpersonal skills. So, uh, and that is something that you'll see and hear me talk about a lot. It's not enough to just think about learning and uh, not include emotions, well-being, the way our kids feel, uh, their mindsets, and so on. That's why we have tried to develop, and I think we've succeeded, a framework that includes all these factors, but I'll try and build towards that in the next few minutes. So what is it that we think constitutes deeper learning? And there are exactly three pillars which are crucial, and I think this makes it easier to break it down in uh, teaching and learning. So first of all, we need to make sure that our kids really understand. That's probably the most important thing. So if I could name one quality of a good teacher, or maybe the, the one that matters most, then I'd say an excellent teacher is somebody who cares about promoting understanding, making sure the kids really understand what it's all about. Okay, no matter where they come from and no matter how long it takes. That has to be priority number one. Next, we know, and there's excellent lit literature out there, that the skills that we need to de de uh, develop in our students will not develop just like this, but they will take time and they will take very intense training. So uh, we believe, and I'll come back to that later, that skill development it's very similar no matter what skill you learn or teach. So uh, learning a language is not that difficult. Certain skills are not, not that much different from learning how to drive a car. In the beginning, it's very complicated and it's very hard to uh, look at all these things, to keep control of the motor running, to have the steering wheel. It's very complex in the beginning. But after time, it's very easy to drive a car, listen to music, talk to somebody, and maybe even look at your cell phone. That is because we have had so much practice. And a result, as a result of that practice, we have automatized so many of these skills. But what that just means is just like with playing soccer or playing an instrument, if we want our students to really get better at stuff, they need time to really practice. And that is what uh, Dan Coyle actually calls deep practice, and I'll get back to that later. And all that will not be working if students and teachers don't develop attitudes or mindsets which says, I believe that I can improve. Or as a teacher, I'm sure that we find a way to make you do things better. And this mindset, the idea of growth mindset, which stems from the research of Carol Dweck, which I will introduce later, is so powerful that it may be even the most important thing. So that I, and that is something that I'll, I'll talk about later. Uh, the way we interact with students, the way we believe in them, or not believe in them. The way we show them how things can be done. That we ourselves are constantly learning and that we make mistakes all the time is one of the key ingredients to deeper learning. If we don't create an atmosphere where students can learn from their mistakes, 
where they get the opportunity, just like in the butterfly video, to redo things, to say, wait, wait a minute, maybe I made, made a mistake, but that was really important because this is the way we learn. I'll get back to that in a minute. So that is what we really need to do. And every kind of curriculum that claims to be in touch with the latest science on learning needs to change in a way that we say limit the amount of content in favor of depth and quality because that is much more important. In the end, if we develop transferable skills based on subject-specific ways of communicating and constructing knowledge, then this is what matters. It doesn't matter that we teach 17 or 19 items. That's even pointless. Okay, but that's a huge journey for everybody involved. And we still don't have all the answers, even though it's like the 21st century. So we grappled with many of these ideas because some of these ideas are really scary and some of them are hard to understand. And some of them, uh, there are issues like transfer that even science doesn't seem to agree on completely. Especially transfer is very, very complex and sophisticated. So we try to sift through all this and come up with something that we can understand. And so this is the one thing that we created to try and understand what it is that happens when we learn. And I can honestly say the things that we have found out and the things that we have developed are among the most important and exciting that I've ever had the pleasure to discover. Because I feel myself understanding things much better. We still haven't understood it all, but it makes more sense. So what is it that happens when we learn in a classroom or in any other situation? So the surface is not bad, surface is a start. So at the beginning of a journey, we meet information. We learn about facts, we may read about something that just happened, and, but we don't fully understand this because it's just isolated facts and observations or events. What we need to do as learners is to make sense of these things. And the English language has a wonderful saying, what we have to do is connect the dots. We need to build patterns. And the more I read, the more people I talk to, the more I believe that learning is all about patterns. Building patterns, making patterns more efficient, making them more complex in anything. And so what learners have to do is to make sense of that information and to build schemata, mental models, or constructs. And if with enough support, patience, and understanding, and enough time, uh, this is successful, then that pattern or that construct or concept will be so stable that we can actually detach it from the original situation and just like a key apply it to a new situation. This is when uh, what scientists call uh, conceptual internalization or internalization of conceptual knowledge. So we have understood things so deeply that they have become a part of who we are and we can apply it to somebody else, to something else. Maybe somebody else, I don't know. But this is what learning is all about. But this process needs time and a few very specific ingredients. So what we learned is that the glue that makes these, or, the or connects these dots, this is language and it's very specific language. This is uh, academic language or the language of learning or some people uh, refer to that as cognitive discourse functions and I will get back to this later. So we relate things and say, okay, this is first and this is second or this is because something else needs to happen first. And all these things, we use language to build knowledge. 
and that's fundamental. So students, and that's the trick, students need to language their understanding because if they talk about it, if they explain it to somebody else, this is how they build understanding and concepts. That is why we need to focus so much on language. There's a big catch, uh, which is in, you know, in every discipline, in every community, you have a number of best of sayings or songs or whatever. So in, in the clear community, everybody keeps saying that every teacher is a language teacher. And I don't think that is true anymore. I think we need to be more precise. I, need to, I think we need to say every teacher is a teacher of the language of the subject he teaches. Because we have found out that subjects use different ways of explaining. They use different ways of describing. They use different ways of arguing. Uh, I once remembered I got, I went to a science, uh, a science event and a conference and I was really taken aback by how intense these discussions are. And then my colleagues said, what did you expect? It's all about arguing about these things. And we are very direct when we do these things because it's about finding the truth. When you go to literature conferences, the way people argue is very different. And that is also at the heart of uh, Jim Pellegrino's definition of deeper learning. It says, it's, we don't do things the same way in different subjects. And there's amazing research by Shanahan and others saying when we look at how people read, for instance, they all use different strategies. So historians read very differently from mathematicians. Social scientists read very differently from physicists. But we need to teach these things to our kids. Say, look, I will help you look at the world through the eyes of a historian, and I will show you how we do history. And this hopefully will help you develop the skills that you can use later on when you read newspaper articles to judge them based according to the things we do in history. Okay, so this is what we mean by deep understanding. When we, when we ask what does it mean for teaching, then it does mean, I think, two things at least. This is taken from a fascinating uh, book by Lentolf and Poner, where they reinterpret Vygotsky's writing and, and, and his research, and a look at, uh, yeah, yeah, where they look at uh, research and say, you know, how do we learn these things? How do we learn to understand? Uh, and they said, there's a number of conditions. First, we need a material or hands-on face, where we have the ability to do things the way a subject would do certain things. So to gather information, to experiment, or maybe to read text, to talk to people, etc. But this very hands-on face, it could also mean working with maps and so on and so forth, needs to be followed up by a face where students get opportunity to talk about their understanding and put their understanding in words. Because it's this process of making thinking more and more abstract which is actually learning. So we need doing is as important as thinking and speaking or writing about it. We need both things. And if they're combined the right way, that's at least a theory, we will reach a stage where both things are so ingrained in our personalities that we can do them almost automatically. So that's one pillar, and there's three. So number two, and this has taken us a while, and it actually has taken me even longer to do this slide, but to me it's the key, or it, it, uh, it, it has everything that I misunderstood about how we learn languages. And at the heart of this is that skills can become automatized through the right kind of training and practice. 
just like playing soccer. With language, it's a little bit more complicated in that experts believe that we have two different memory systems. One for language rules, of the rules in general, and one for the applied language in action. So they call one the rule-based system and the other the memory-based system. Now the problem is, and this is why teaching languages is so complex and difficult, there's no shortcut between the two memory systems. And what that means is when I want students to go from simple present, third person, you always have to add the S, that's a clear rule, to actually using that automatically, I have to come up with really good practice activities. Because if I just ask students to do traditional grammar training, then all I will achieve is train the rule-based system. Okay, and maybe that is difficult to understand. So maybe it's better to use uh, physical examples. That's like training the biceps all the time. But if you exclusively train the biceps, you will not train the triceps. So students will be able to tell you the rule, but if you sh ask them to write something, they will make the same mistake. And that's because they have the rule, but they don't know how to apply it. So they haven't yet automatized it is the language we use. So since there is no direct connection between these two, we need to go the more complex way, unfortunately. So instead of doing too much grammar, we need to balance this carefully. And this is taken from Roy Lister and, and, uh, and Alice saying, we need different types of practice. We need controlled practice, biceps, gap filling stuff, as much as we need communicative practice and probably we need more tasks, more real life like authentic situations for them to really learn these things. That is why it's so tricky and that is why, and as absurd as it seems, if we want our students to become better at grammar, we maybe should focus less on grammar. Okay, that sounds really absurd, but it took me years to understand this. And if you're interested in that as a language teacher, I highly recommend uh, reading uh, Michael Lewis, for instance, and, and the lexical approach. He says, for instance, that if your grammar is not good enough, you need to know more words. And what he means is, in real sentences, in real language packets, which he calls chunks. This is where we learn how to apply grammar. So if our students listen to authentic sources, if they watch uh, English TV shows, if they read challenging texts, if they enjoy uh, listening to English podcasts and so on, and at the same time, if there's a focus on analyzing these things, and if there's a clear focus on learning collocations and all these things, then we can help them progress. And still, what we have to come to live with, and that is something that I think we all know as language teachers, it still will take a long time. So my son has just finished eighth grade, and by definition, according to the curriculum, he should know all the verb tenses in both active and the passive voice. And the funny thing is, that's true, but only within very isolated exercises. And if you ask him to do the same things four weeks later, the picture is very, very different. And that is because these things are not solidified yet. They're not ready to be used, and they're not stable yet. And that is because there's still too much focus on grammar. If we could, we, if instead we can focus on listening, we can focus on so many things, viewing, reading, and we will still very actively support learning. So what that means is for both subject and content teachers, we really need to carefully to think about what we mean by progression. 
And in some subjects more than others, we still cling to ideas of learning that are no longer in touch with science. So uh, grammar is one, for instance. The idea that we learn languages or foreign languages by moving from one grammar phenomenon to the other does not seem to, there doesn't seem to be much evidence for this. The truth is it's probably more complex and it's also messier. Okay, but these things are really important. So the other thing that is very important about deep practice is students need time to review their products. So when they write an article, when they present something, and if we think that for whatever reason it's not good enough, they need time and support to do it again, just like in the video. Because that is when we learn. That is when real learning happens, when we get the chance to do it again and to learn from our mistakes. Dan Cole, the author of the Talent co uh, Code, he even goes as far, he says, we only learn from mistakes, okay? And if we are in a, an environment where mistakes are not appreciated, we won't learn. I'll come back to that later because I think it's mind boggling. Okay, uh, and what does that mean? It means when we really need to be aware of what it is that we want our students to do. So it is very, it's a very worthwhile goal to say, I want you to become better at writing essays, right? Because that is an important goal. But here's where it gets tricky. Just because I ask you to write essays will not automatically mean that you get better automatically. And, uh, I have read amazing interviews with excellent or expert sports people or musician and a, a soccer trainer, for instance, he would never tell his team to just go out and play for 90 minutes and expect them to become better. Everybody would agree that this is not efficient training, but what they do is break things down into much smaller components and train them again and again and again because this high revision, uh, high quality repetition, which is not mindless drilling. It's, it's in language we have a number of things that are toxic. And if we say practice, people will automatically think, oh, this is drill and kill. That's not true and that's not what I'm saying. There is a type of practice which Dan Cole calls deep practice, which says I do things slowly again and again, and every time I do it, I check for mistakes. And I try to learn from these mistakes. And I analyze myself, I reflect on this. And this kind of reflected repetition with support from my teacher is what he calls deep practice. And he says, this is how we learn. And he goes even further, he says what happens, and that's really fascinating, but I'm not, a, a brain expert, so I can only tell you what I read about this. He says, we used to think that the most important thing is learning is create new synapses in the brain. So create new connections is what it's all about. But he says, maybe we have to rethink this because in focusing on synapses, we forgot about the connection between nerve fibers. And he says, they are coded in a layer and this is called myelin. And he says the amazing thing is that more we practice, the thicker that myelin layer becomes. And he compares that to internet connection. He says it's a difference between a traditional old modem and very fast glass fiber internet. Fiberglass internet probably in English. And he says so if we practice correctly, we can become better at almost anything because it's all in the way we learn and practice. And so he does not believe uh, in the roles of genes so much. He said they are important, but we can do so much more through the right kind of training and the right kind of education. And this is really something we need to rethink. So instead of telling our students to simply write something, 
we need to think of how to break these down into their component parts and think about what we can do to really teach them how to become better at each of these things before we put them together. And of course, and that goes with everything that I've tried to say today, all of this takes time. Okay, and none of this can be rushed. So we need to become probably, as curriculum writers, become much clearer in what it is that we want our students to learn in that limited amount of time that we have to really set the right priorities. Okay, uh, I'll skip a few. Uh, wait a minute, I just need a different kind of view. It's easier. So I can skip some of the slides which are not that important. So what matters, again, is that if we want to go deep, we need to follow the logic of the subjects. And that is called disciplinary literacies. And th that is at the top of the literacy pyramid. It's taken from Shanahan. So when we show our students how to work and think and act like geographers in an age-appropriate way, we, then this is the way we can teach them to really understand things at a deeper level. But that means that first and foremost, we really have to rethink what we mean by subject-specific literacy. So what is it that we're talking about? What is it that distinguishes how history, people look at texts from socialists or from, so, so, sorry, from sociologists or from physicists and so on and so forth. And there has been quite some progress uh, that has been published. So people now believe that subjects or different disciplines are different in five core constructs. In the way that they create knowledge, in the way they inquire, and in the way they reason. The overarching principles and concepts, uh, principles and concepts they apply, but also in the language that they use. So it's the strategies they employ to read, for instance, the way they create new information, the way they talk about that information, and the different uh, ways of creating new information. For some, it's looking, uh, digging holes in the ground to analyze the soil. For others, it's talking to witnesses. It's reading historical accounts. For others, it's making experiments. But what we have to uh, accept, I think, is that we need to really focus on the way a subject works. Or the Americans are a little bit, have a different language of expressing this. They said we need to look at the heart and soul of the subject, which makes a lot of sense. So what is this? In historical literacy, people have uh, made quite a, a lot of advances. So they speak of the six concepts of historical thinking. So this is how history people approach learning. And as you can see, each of these requires quite a lot of language, but it's specific language. And what we have tried to do is try to answer the question of how we can create progressions in subjects. So how can we start with young learners and where do we go? And the Australians use a very beautiful idea for this. They speak of knowledge pathways into a subject. So how can we help our learners become better at the many ways we construct knowledge and communicate knowledge in a subject? And what we learned is that we can probably only do this right if we reach a different understanding of language. And I, I say that every time I talk about this, uh, we talked about this with Nagore and, and Pilar yesterday, I said, I wish we had a different word for language. One that is different from the idea that language teachers use. Because when you use language, you have a specific idea of it. And, but what I think we need when it comes to deeper learning is a very different idea of language. And for that, we don't have a separate word, but I think we should have one. 
So what, the, uh, what Mohan and others use is the idea of making meaning, helping students become better at expressing their understanding and their knowledge of things. And this does not mean that progress equals making fewer mistakes. That's not it. But making pro progress in meaning making is becoming better at expressing things at a deeper level, level and expressing it accordingly. So understanding things deeper and having the linguistic skills to express that appropriately. And that is very different from the way we used to treat language in language classes. And that is a huge shift because it will affect the way we grade papers, for instance. It's very different from counting grammar mistakes and spelling mistakes to moving on to, well, how good was your explanation? It's very different to, from looking at paragraph writing, saying how well does he connect paragraphs, which is important, but I think it's at least as important to look inside the individual paragraph and say, well, he wanted to describe something in that paragraph, so let's see how well he described things. And maybe we can help him express and, and describe things at a better level. So how do we make progress in a subject, in any kind of subject? And we also learned from the Australians. They have looked at many, many textbooks and analyzed them from different subjects and said, how do we map progression? And what they've come up with is a system that is both ingenious and simple at the same time. Because they say the way subjects make meaning consists of basically four key activities, which they call activity domains. So in any given subject, we perform specific procedures to create new information. We, we talk to people. We read books, we read articles, we read novels, we do experiments, we calculate, uh, we solve problems, but then we need to sort out this new information. So we need to organize uh, that information. And once we've structured it somehow, we need to explain what we found in an experiment, for instance. Or we need to make see how what that certain person I just interviewed or that certain source I just read, how that matches the overall context, the historical context. And once we've done all that, we need to argue our understanding because we usually use our knowledge to change things, to help people think differently, to uh, argue about things, and hopefully to convince people. And this sounds just like another taxonomy. But I honestly think it's more. I think hidden in there is, to, is the key to a very different kind of a teaching and learning experiments, uh, experience, and it hides in this table which we took from John Polius, which is an excellent book on how we can teach science. And what it says here is that for all the four activities that we see in school, so doing, organizing, explaining, and arguing, we have textual equivalents, text types, or genres that we use to communicate our understanding. So each activity has a flip side and a linguistic equivalent that we use to communicate it. And where this gets better, much better, and much more useful is when you look at different kinds of explanations. So that was the first time I ever saw somebody writing about explanations and saying there are different types of explanations. And I used to think that being in the business of explaining as a teacher, I should know about these things. I should know, A, how to explain things really well in such a way that my children hopefully understand. And I should also know 
how to teach kids how to explain properly. But the truth is, I didn't know anything about how to explain well other than my intuition, and I knew next to nothing of how to teach kids how to explain. But if I don't know how to teach kids how to explain, it is very difficult to teach kids how to understand. So we need to rethink. And what we've come up with is something that honestly and without any kind of exaggeration changed the way I literally, uh, I literally taught in my own classroom. So here's what we found. I'll show you the system and then I'll show you the things that we did in my classroom. So there are different kinds of explanations based on the pattern, the cognitive pattern that we see, we can find different explanations. So there's this type of explanations that you, your students probably use most of the time. So first we did this and then we did something else. Okay, it's a typical situation and most kids will do that in kindergarten but also in secondary education. And it's not bad, but it's not actually what we want from our students. And the reason that that is the case is that this is what linguists call a sequential explanation, which works in a certain time frame. So first this, then something else. But what we want our students to do is, because of A, B happens. So what we want them to be able to understand what is cause and what is effect. And we want them to be able to combine these things, right? Well, if they are able to name causes and effects and explain them and combine them well, then we have a proper explanation. Also, if they use causal explanation, they will be able to answer my why questions. As long as I'm moving or they're moving in a sequential pattern, they're not able to understand why my why questions cannot be answered by them. It's because they move here and I want them to do this. And in reality, it gets much more complex. It's not just that we have simple cause and effect situations, but we have complex situations where several things have one effect, like there's a million of reasons that actually led to the financial global crisis. Or we have uh, the case that one event triggers many other things. And probably there's a mixture of all of them. So as our understanding of context and content evolves, those patterns become more and more complex. So we no longer think this happens because something else happened, but we understand that things are more complex. This is progression because our conceptual understanding becomes deeper and more complex. So what that means is we can now manipulate content based on this idea. So when we teach younger students, we can make it easier by reducing the pattern, saying there's no way why we cannot talk about World War I or II in primary school, but we will break this down in such a way that you can understand it more easily. So we will modify the pattern. But at the same time, we have to help them express these things at a different level. And what that means is we can now make things more complex or less complex based on this idea. So we can manipulate the pattern and the language. And it gets even better. And I'll show you what that means here. So the example that I'll show you was taken from my geography lesson with eighth graders. It should be right here. And it's nothing fancy, and the thing that I regret is, until this day, that I didn't just take my phone and record what happened. 
So what you'll see here is uh, the, German, uh, the German content and the way we translate it into English. It was a German geography lesson. And after spending weeks of trying to learn about the tropical climate in the rainforest, this is the explanation that our school book, our textbook, and we together came up with. So doing lots of experiments and then we work with worksheets, traditional way of teaching and learning. And all this isn't bad. And I listened to a student talk to me and explain these things to me. And after reading about these linguistic things, I finally understood what it means for my classroom. Is that the students are still moving in a temporal pattern. So they're still thinking first this and then this. But as long as they're moving in a temporal pattern, they're not able to say, this is why this happens. And if they're not able to say, this is why it happens, they don't fully understand it. So what we can do next is we can do what we as teachers can always do. We can work at this systematically saying, okay, now I'll show you real quick how to really explain. And all we need is causes and effects. Now let's go through this and identify causes and effects in the first step, and then try to find ways of connect these. And we can do that in colloquial English, using our bigs, and we can do it in more expert-like language. And we no longer believe in bigs and cub being these two really different things and that one is more difficult than the others, but I think they live off each other and they feed off each other. So our students should be able to express things in everyday language because if they use everyday language, they cannot hide behind terminology. They have to show if they really understand it. It's the same with us. If we meet, if we have a group meeting, you can tell the very specific moment when one of, one of us does not fully understand because we move on to hide behind academic language. And we formulate these really nebulous clauses which simply mean we have lost the plot. Okay, and this is when we always say, well, what is it that you want to say? Okay, speak plainly and make it easy for us to understand. And this is why we ourselves have to admit, well, wait a minute, well, maybe we have to go back and rethink this because obviously we haven't fully understood it. So this must work two ways. We can use all sorts of tricks and linguistic things to turn an everyday language into an academic one. So we can use nominalizations and all sorts of tricks, but this is not what this is about. We will have a look at that in the next session how, on how to really do this practically. But after just 20 minutes of serious work, these eighth graders, who are like between eight, 13 and 14 years old, came up with this explanation. And if I talk to scientists, and geographers, and part of me was trained as a geographer, I'm much happier with this explanation because it carries much more meaning. Also, it's more appropriate. In the scientific language is more dense, but it's nothing but chunking. And in this dense formulation, we can put more knowledge in there. So it helps us express complex things. So and what that means is that this focus on language is not something that you know is very, very difficult to do. It's just like a switch that we have to turn somewhere in our head and say, you know, now, from now on, every lesson I will spend five to 10 minutes on a simple question. Now, can you tell me if you understood? And then we really listen to the kids and say, is that good enough? And if it's not good enough, let's work on this. And I fully believe that if every subject teacher spends five to 10 minutes on this kind of fine tuning of understanding and languaging, just five to 10 minutes a day, our students would become much better at this.
And what we would see is deeper understanding. Not within a week, but certainly across a, a time span of several years. Okay, that is the linguistic part. And I will show you later, unfortunately, it's really complex. And I'm sorry, but learning is complex. It's really complex. But what we try to do is this. This is the essence of our way of looking at learner progressions. So what that means is we can give students the tools, the linguistic tools, to explain things. And what that will result in is a proper explanation. Or if we, can, if we combine definitions, explanations, and other things, we will get a small lab report, a full-blown genre. Now, as students progress in time, they will know more. Their understanding and their linguistic tools will become more sophisticated. So the product should be more adequate. But it's still something that's quite age appropriate. But what matters from our perspective is that as students move from beginners or novices to advanced, we will try to do our best to help them develop a much deeper understanding and the tools to express that understanding in more and more adequate language. But we can start easy in primary school, but if we have the right tools to manipulate the language of learning, we can teach them how to become much better at expressing this. Okay. And I know this is probably quite a lot to take in. So how much before the first session ends? Oh, so I just have pillar two. So we do the next, the next step afterwards, okay? So we'll move on later. So have I already finished lesson number one? I got so much more. Okay, so let's just take a break here, okay? Yeah, and, I'll, and then we'll just continue here. And by the way, you don't need to, well, if you want to, you can take pictures all you want, but I'll leave my whole presentation, everything else here. So you, if you find this useful and interesting, go back to my original presentation. It's usually much more convenient than looking at photos. Yeah? Okay, see you later. Bueno, thank you very much.